We are going to start equipping hour now and just so thankful that you're here. Today we are um, just doing a one part series on faith and the Great Commission. What is biblical faith? And we're gonna primarily look at it in the book of Acts. A little project of mine over the last year was to think about how the book of Acts actually presents what faith is. Um, How does it describe it while the apostles and the church are on the Great Commission? And you can really do this with any book of your Bible. I mean, can you think about how rich of a study you would, um, what you would benefit from if you just looked at what Genesis said about faith? Um, And you can do this really with any topic in any book. I chose Acts in regards to studying it and thinking about faith because it is the church planting manual of the Great Commission. And Acts shows us how the Great Commission in Matthew 28, verses 19 to 20, uh, it shows us how it actually unfolded. What did, they, what, did, what did Jesus mean by that when he said, go therefore into all the nations and make disciples? What did he mean? Well, as the apostles preached the gospel from Jerusalem, then deep into Roman Gentile territory, They gathered those who believed the gospel into local gatherings that they called churches. And so they preached the gospel with the aim to plant churches from one location to the next location to the next location. And I wanted to know what that book says about faith. It has a unique vantage point and contribution to make to what biblical faith is. And this morning, I want you to know what it says about faith. And of course, if you restrict any biblical topic study to just one book of the Bible, you will not get all that the Bible says about that subject. So no one book can say everything about any one subject. And so I know that I have set you up then for some disappointment because Acts does not say about faith what Hebrews 11.1 says. And Acts does not say what Romans 4 says about faith. And Acts does not say what Genesis 15 says about Abraham's faith. But God designed Acts to have a unique voice and contribution and perspective to make in the Bible on every subject. And this morning, especially faith. And that's what I want to give ourselves this morning is, what is this unique book's contribution to the whole Bible's understanding of what biblical faith is? So you can take your Bibles and you can open them to the book of Acts. And as we do that, we should pray because we always need help when we come to God's word. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for the way that it is um, food for our souls Man does not live on bread alone, but he lives by, on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And we, if we never eat another meal, we have your word and we have everything we need to step into eternity. It is that good. It is that powerful. It is that profound. It is that securing. It is that comforting. And so I pray that as we come to your word this morning, Lord, that we would have hearts that are soft, hearts that are awakened, hearts that are alert, hearts that are eager to discover what biblical faith is. Give us insight into our own hearts and lives to see if we have this biblical faith. So draw near to us now. We need you, we love you, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to start with a definition of faith, and then I'll illustrate it and describe that definition from the book of Acts. So this is my working definition of faith, all right? Here it is up on the screen. Faith is... The God-encompassed, whole casting of self on resurrected Christ for salvation and for daily living. That's what biblical faith is. It is the God-encompassed, whole casting of self on resurrected Christ for salvation and for daily living. So let's take this piece by piece. Let's talk about God encompassed. What on earth do I mean by that? God encompassed. If you could somehow draw a circle around all that God is and all that God is doing in this world, biblical faith is within that. 
It's within that, not outside of it. It's within that. Biblical faith is within that circle of his agenda and his plan. Biblical faith is God-encompassed. It is swallowed up in him and all that he wants and all that he is doing. So I'm going to try to say this as many different ways as I can before we illustrate it from Acts, okay? Biblical faith, saving faith, is something that is completely enveloped within God and within his purposes. It is within his design. He surrounds it. Biblical faith is his idea. His idea. It is his possession to give. Biblical faith exists because of him. And it exists within the realm of his divine frame of reference. Biblical faith has his fingerprints all over it. It's all about him. Biblical faith is framed within his redemption agenda. It exists and it operates only because of God. It is under his oversight to do with what he wants. It operates under his permission. Biblical faith is rooted in God. It is concerned with his concerns. It is secured by him. It is secured for him. Biblical faith is consumed within him. It is governed by him. It is superintended by him. Faith is not a missing ingredient in what God wants to do. Like he gathered everything up that he is and that he wants to do and goes, oh, biblical faith's over there. It's encompassed in God, by God. Let me contrast that. Biblical faith is not your idea. It is not framed up by you and within your purposes. Biblical faith does not come onto the scene in your life by your wisdom and by your planning. Biblical faith was not your idea. It is not your idea. It is not your creation or your resource to do within the world as you please. Biblical faith does not operate under your oversight in this world. It does not operate with your permission. It does not answer to you. Biblical faith is not governed by you. And your concerns. You did not draw a great big huge circle of self-sovereignty and put biblical faith in there for your purposes. Biblical faith for me is not Scott encompassed. Biblical faith is God encompassed. Now, let's allow the church planting manual of the Great Commission to teach us this first important part of the definition of biblical faith. Go to Acts chapter 14, verse 27. This is the end of Paul's first missionary journey. He was sent out by the church in Antioch of Syria. He went out with Barnabas. They have returned now to their sending church in Antioch of Syria. Acts chapter 14, verse 27, this is what it says. And when they had arrived and gathered the church together, they began to report all the things that God had done with them and how he, how God had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. Listen, if any sinner is going to have access to this biblical faith that is encompassed within God, he has to open the door. It operates under his agenda. He must open a door for it. Let's go back just a little in time to Acts chapter 11. Turn back to Acts 11 verses 19 to 21. This is when the gospel came to that church in Antioch of Syria. When the gospel came to that region, look at Acts chapter 11 verse 19. So then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen back in Jerusalem, they made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch. That's the Antioch of Syria. Speaking the word to no one except Jews alone. So as the Jewish believers in Jerusalem scattered, most of them only spoke to Jews, other Jews. They went to synagogues. But, verse 20, there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch of Syria, and they began to speak to the Greeks also, proclaiming the good news of the Lord Jesus. Now watch this, verse 21. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. Why did a large number turn to the Lord? 
How is it that they, this large number turned to Jesus Christ and believed? It tells us in verse 21, the hand of the Lord was with those preaching the gospel. So the God who encompasses that biblical faith put out his powerful hand upon the messengers and the message preached such that those, when they heard it, believed and they turned to Christ. It was all under the operative design of God and the power of his hand. Let's go to Acts chapter 13, verse 46. This is on Paul's first missionary journey. He's in a different Antioch now, Antioch of Pisidia. And he's teaching to the synagogues and in the synagogues and the Jews are rejecting Messiah Jesus. And this is what is said in chapter 13, verses 46 to 48. Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and they said, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you Jews first. Since you reject it, And judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles, so the Lord has commanded us. I've placed you as a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the end of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life, that's how many believed. Biblical faith does not take its cue from the sinner. Biblical faith takes its cue from the electing God's choice. He does not leave those sinners that he has appointed to eternal life to figure it out for themselves. Look, I appointed you eternal life, but now you've got to figure out how you get there. He didn't leave them to themselves to exercise their own self-made version of faith. No self-encompassed faith, no self-generated faith, no self-styled faith, no self-manufactured faith will result in eternal life. They need access to his faith that he encompasses. So let's put these passages together. So those who are appointed to eternal life, he opens a door of faith to them. And then he puts his powerful hand on the messengers and the message and sinners appointed to eternal life believed. God encompassed. This is about God. Biblical faith is God encompassed. A familiar New Testament way to describe this was stated by Peter in the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15. Just turn to Acts chapter 15 verse 11. The familiar way for the New Testament to describe this is found there. But we believe that we are saved through what? The grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they, the Gentiles, are also. Meaning, biblical faith is a gift given by God to us from his realm to us. Salvation, and especially biblical faith that connects us with eternal life, is not your self-made faith that you already had in you somewhere, but you just hadn't self-activated it yet. Let me give you an illustration. In the home that I grew up in, we had in our kitchen the greatest junk drawer ever. It was the biggest one on the bottom, and it was super heavy, It took both hands. It took me being on the floor, sitting in front of it, putting one foot up against the other cupboard and pulling it out, and I could could get it open. And from time to time, I would forget that we had that junk drawer. And then all of a sudden, I would be in the kitchen, I would see it, and I would be like, oh, I wonder what treasures are in there now. And I would sit down, and I'd pull that big thing out, and I would just start sifting through all of its treasures. And oftentimes I would find something that I hadn't seen in it before. I didn't know we had it. And I can remember lifting up pieces and stuff and tools out and saying to my mom, I didn't know we had one of these. What does it do? Listen, biblical faith is not like that in any way. Biblical faith is not something that you have already within the junk drawer of your life, but you just haven't self-activated it yet. Biblical faith is not Scott encompassed. 
Biblical faith is outside of you, but must come from the God who encompasses it to you. So let's put all of these verses together. Biblical faith is a gift from God by his grace. He must open the door of it for you, and his hand of power must be applied to the preaching of the gospel, whether from a mom or a dad or a sibling or from a preacher or a missionary or whoever. A hand of power must, God's hand of power must be applied to the preaching of the gospel so that you can believe and the eternal life that he intends for you to have, you will receive by grace, through faith alone, in Christ alone, without any works. So what does that mean, practically even? On the Great Commission in your household, moms, dads, um, in your neighborhoods, on your walks, as you are out and you're interacting with your neighbors, in your workplace, when you get back into school, there's nobody here who goes to school because, well, there's not very many because they're all at camp, most of them. In your classrooms, everywhere you are, we should first and foremost plead with God to open the door of faith to sinners who are perishing. We should plead with God, God, would you please, as I, I need to go in and I need to talk to my son, would you please put your hand of power on what I need to say? So that those that we are bringing the gospel to can believe. Let's go to the source of faith, the one who has it. God himself, and let's plead with him to give the gift of grace to those that we are laboring with the gospel among. And also, as you turn to the ones you're sharing the gospel with, you may be in a tribe far away like Zach and Cass. You may be in your living room with your little one before you. We are never encouraging sinners to look within themselves for resources that they do not possess. You are turning them away from themselves to look to God. He must open the door of faith to them. He must put his powerful hand upon what is being said to them so that they are receiving by faith the eternal life that he has for them. Jesus said in John 6, 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me and the one who comes to me I will never cast out. You tell them that. You come to Jesus, and if you know you do not have resources, and he's the only one who does, he does not cast out the one who comes to him for it. He loves to save sinners who know they have no resources within themselves to change their deplorable condition. God, this is amazing, guys. God requires of sinners a faith that they do not have in themselves. And he says that faith that you do not have yourself, that you can't muster up, is the one that will save you from my wrath. And then in the greatest mercy and grace of all, he gives them that very faith that he requires of them. What kind of God is that? So the first part of our biblical definition is biblical faith is God encompassed. It, it is from him. It is through him. It is about him. It is directing us toward him. Let's consider the next part of the definition. When that God encompassed faith is given by grace into the sinner's heart by the powerful hand of God, when the door of faith is open to them and sinners walk through it to receive eternal life by faith, what exactly does that look like? What does that look like? How does that faith express itself? Well, that's the second part of our definition. Faith is God, is the God encompassed, whole casting of self on Christ. The imagery here that this phrasing is supposed to capture is this. Biblical faith is as if you could somehow pick yourself up and just throw yourself down on a stretcher. Christ, the stretcher of salvation. 
When God-encompassed faith is received, the believing one casts himself down entirely on Christ the stretcher, refusing to partially lean on himself like a crutch. That's actually a striking contrast. With a crutch, you've got 50% of your weight on it and you're doing something. That is not what biblical faith is. You do not say to Jesus, look, I'll lean on you and I'll, do, I'll, I'll put my effort in too. With a crutch, you are exercising some self-located strength. With a stretcher, you're done. You're, you're just done with you. I'm just going to lay down. I can't get myself where I need to go. I'm just going to lay down on you, Christ, and you get me out of this deplorable place I'm in that I've created for myself and get me to rescue, get me to my deliverance. When the door to biblical faith is opened, when the hand of God is upon the preaching of the gospel, the one who's appointed to eternal life casts himself entirely on Christ by grace. He lies down, so to speak, on Jesus Christ. That means that biblical faith knows nothing of giving only parts of yourself to Christ or a portion of yourself to Christ. God doesn't open the door of faith. He doesn't put his powerful hand on the gospel with the result that a sinner would say, I'll give you Sundays, but not Friday nights. I'm fine if we uh, do this Bible thing in the house, but not, not, not at work and not at school. Another way to describe this all-consuming nature of faith, this whole casting of self on Christ, is biblical faith requires every square inch of you, and it fills up every square inch of you. There is to be no arena of your life that is off limits or beyond the reach of biblical faith. And Acts has some men within it that exemplify this. Can you think of a couple men and how they're described? Look at Acts chapter 6, verse 5, talking about Stephen. You know, they had a trouble in the early church. There were widows who were not being served food daily. And to correct it, they put together a group of men, like prototype deacon type men. And Stephen was one of them. Look at chapter 6, verse 5. And this word pleased the whole congregation. This plan pleased the congregation. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Go over to chapter 11, verse 24. When, that, when the gospel expanded to Antioch of Syria, they wanted to send Barnabas up there, and Luke remembers him as eleven twenty-four. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and full of faith, and a considerable crowd was brought to the Lord. Every dimension of these men's lives had been touched by the waterline of biblical faith. If you are full of faith, if you have cast your whole self on Christ, you are empty of self-reliance. Empty. If you're full of faith, you are empty of self-trust. Think of Stephen, a man full of his faith. Go back to Acts chapter 7. Verses 51 to 60. Think of Stephen, a man full of his faith in the climactic intensification of the persecution against him. He saw the ascended Christ that he had wholly cast himself upon. Do you remember chapter 7, verse 55? Being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven intently and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see that. I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Nothing in that do or die moment could persuade him to give that one up, could persuade him to tone down his faith. There was nobody around him going, Stephen, just back off a little bit, just a little over the board, over the top here. Nothing could get him to ration his faith. Nothing could get him to compartmentalize his faith. Nothing could get him to be a little less than full of faith. Nothing could persuade him to no longer lie down on that one who was at the right hand of God. Why would he get off that stretcher at that moment? He was willing to pour his life out even into death for Christ, and he did, and that was in Jerusalem. What about out and among the Gentiles? 
Go to Acts chapter 19. Let's watch what happened and how faith expressed itself even among the Gentiles. Go to Acts chapter 19, verse 18. Think of what happened in Ephesus when the gospel came there through the Apostle Paul. The believers in Ephesus, they, they saw the bankruptcy of what they had formerly been entrusting themselves to prior to Christ. It was the occult. It was, it was magic. And now they were so entrusted and given over to Jesus Christ that they wanted nothing to do with their former object of trust anymore. And so what did they do? You remember? They burned their books. Look at chapter 19, verse 18. And many of those who had believed, there it is, they believed. What did that that belief look like? Well, they kept coming, confessing and disclosing their practices. And many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and were burning them in the sight of everyone. This is a public thing. They didn't do it in private where nobody could see it. And they counted up the price of them and they found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver. Listen, that's 50,000 days worth of wages. Can you imagine 50,000 days of work? Why is biblical faith so all-consuming like this in a life? Why would a sinner want to wholly cast himself on Christ and not withhold any part of himself from Christ for the two reasons that we've seen in Stephen and in Ephesus? First, the reason you're willing to give all of yourself to Christ is because of the incomparable worth of Jesus Christ. For Stephen, the heavens actually did open up and he could see the incomparable worth of Christ and he could not be persuaded to give up any of himself or withhold any of himself from that one. When biblical faith comes to you and like Stephen, upon seeing Jesus with the eyes of biblical faith in his word, you will not want to withhold any part of yourself from that one who is so worthy. The second reason Biblical faith is so all-consuming is because like the Ephesian believers, you will not hold on to any part of you or the self-reliance you had before Christ because the eyes of biblical faith have allowed you to see how spiritually dreadful you were and how you made yourself deplorable in his eyes before Christ. If you could, you'd burn every book of self-reliance and sin like the Ephesians did. God-encompassed faith lets you finally see yourself as you truly are in God's eyes without Christ. And biblical faith will persuade you convincingly to no longer trust in yourselves, even just a little bit. Self-confidence is negated by biblical faith. It convinces you that you have nothing worth trusting in within yourself. So that is why you are full of biblical faith and you cast yourself wholly on Jesus Christ. He is that worthy and you are that great of a sinner without him. And so this is why in your time in the word, you are dragging your sorry carcass to this Bible every day so that you get greater and greater glimpses of the glory of Jesus Christ in the word of God. And this is why you are studying the Bible so that you see the exceeding sinfulness of your sin so that you can remain somebody who is full of faith, casting everything of yourself on him and turning everything of yourself away from your former way of life. And this is one of the primary reasons why, on a human level, the Great Commission can advance into the most difficult places on earth to go. This is why Christians would sell themselves into slavery so that they could go be a missionary among other slaves in the Caribbean. This is why the Great Commission can advance to the most difficult places on earth. This is why the Great Commission can advance under the most distressing conditions of human history. Listen, World War II, World War I, world wars don't stop this because Christians are full of faith. This is why the Great Commission advances even into a family that is hostile towards Jesus Christ. Another person comes to faith because a Christian won't shut up. This is why the Great Commission can advance into threatening classrooms on university campuses. 
Because biblical faith moves the believer to cast his everything on Christ, no matter the consequences. He is that worthy, and they've burned the ships. They're not going back to where they were before. And so the question is, has this God-encompassed whole casting of self onto Jesus Christ, has it been your experience yet? I'm not asking if you know some facts about Jesus and you like those, the idea of those facts. That's not what I'm asking. Biblical faith would never lead you to consider Jesus to be one good idea among many ideas and ideologies in the world. Biblical faith is not that way. Biblical faith would never be content for you to merely agree with some facts and even affirm some facts about Jesus. Biblical faith does not ask you to make Jesus a part of your life. Biblical faith, when given as a gift of grace from God, it expresses itself through you abandoning yourself and casting yourself entirely on him. The message of Jesus Christ crucified for the forgiveness of sins and raised from the dead requires from you and everybody you preach to requires a life-altering, full-souled captivation, a whole casting of self on Christ. So the God-encompassed whole casting of self is indeed on Christ. That's what we have in parentheses up there. But Acts makes it especially clear that the focal point of faith in the Great Commission is Christ raised from the dead. That's the next part of our definition. Faith is the God-encompassed whole casting of self on resurrected Christ. Jesus is not merely our Savior who died for us. It's beyond words that he did that. It's beyond words that he did that for rebels like me and you. And we rejoice that he suffered as he did as our substitute, bearing away the wrath of God and our guilt and securing a forgiveness of sins. It's, it's incomparable. Nothing should be taken away from any of that. The one that we are to cast our whole self on by faith, he certainly died for us. But he is the Savior who is alive from the dead. He's alive. Many men in the first century were crucified under the Romans on a Roman cross and were put in a, in a grave. But only one man came forth with this resurrection of Jesus. And it was him. And Acts makes it very clear from its start that the focal point for our faith is specifically Jesus Christ raised from the dead. Go back to Acts chapter 1. I want you to see this. Acts chapter 1. So right after Jesus ascends into heaven in chapter 1, verses 9, 10, and 11, the disciples are all gathered together. Verse 15, this is where things are at. Uh, three years after Jesus' ministry, there are 120 persons willing to risk being together as his disciples. 120 in Jerusalem after three years. And they decide, and they know that they need to replace Judas and so they want to do that. And I want you to see what is on their minds. This is how the book of Acts starts. These are the guys who are going to go plant churches across the world. Chapter 1, verse 21. It is necessary that of the men who have accompanied us, accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. Well, what do you mean, all the time that Jesus went in and out among us? Well, this is what I mean. Uh, beginning with the baptism of John, which was day one of his public ministry, of Jesus' public ministry, until the day that he was taken up from us, that's Acts chapter 1, verse 9, we need to find one person in there who was with us the whole time. And look how verse 22 ends. One of these must become a witness with us of what? his resurrection. They know that what they must go run and declare to everybody who will listen to them is Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. How many men did they find who fit that qualification? So they turn to the 120 in the room and they say, we need a man who has been with us from the beginning of John the Baptist ministry and Jesus' public ministry and who saw him rise and ascend into heaven in Acts chapter one, verse nine. How many we got? 
How many came forward? That's all they had to choose from. And so they cast lots and they picked Matthias. The focal point, the point is, even in a dire situation like that, you only got two guys who qualify, and there's only 120 of them, but they're going to go change the world. And the focal point has to be, you're going to be a witness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The apostles made the focal point of biblical faith, specifically Christ raised from the dead. They did that in Jerusalem, through Samaria, with a Roman soldier named Cornelius, and they did it even into the Gentile world of wisdom in Athens. Let me show you. Go to chapter 3, verse 15. Let's look in Jerusalem. 3.15. Here's what Jesus said, or uh, Peter said um, to the crowd after healing a man. Chapter 3, verse 15. But you put to death the author of life, whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. And on the basis of faith in his name, that one who is raised from the dead, it is the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man whom you see now. And the faith which is through him, that one who was raised from the dead, it has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. As they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them and they were greatly agitated because they were teaching the people. Did his enemies know what the focal point was? Did, did the enemies of the gospel know what they were making a big deal about? Did they know? Look, they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus what? The resurrection of the dead. And that really ticked them off. And so they laid hands on them, put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. But watch this. But many of those who had heard the message, the message of what? Uh, that they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They heard that. And what did they do when they heard that? They believed. And a number of the men came to be about 5,000. Have you ever seen 5,000 people come to Christ like that? That's Jerusalem. Let's go beyond Jerusalem. Let's see what happened when the gospel first went to Cornelius, or first went to the Gentiles to Cornelius. Go to Acts chapter 10, verse 39. Here's Peter preaching to the, those gathered in the home that Cornelius has gathered together. Chapter 10, verse 39. And we are witnesses of all the things that he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They also put him to death by hanging him on a tree. By the way, does Peter downplay um, the, 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 his death? No. It's not this or that. It's both. So he makes a big deal about the death of Jesus Christ. And verse 40, God raised him up on the third day and granted that he appear not to all people, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God. That is to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach. That resurrected one commanded us to preach and to solemnly bear witness that this is the one who has been designated by God as judge of the living and the dead. And of him, all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sin. What must they believe about him if they're going to get forgiveness of sin? Can they get forgiveness of sin if they don't believe he's raised from the dead? No, it must be a part of the message. You go into deep into Gentile territory where the wise men of the world are. Go to Acts chapter 17. Let's go to Athens and watch Paul upon Areopagus bringing the gospel to bear on the philosophers. 17 verse 31, he says this, He has fixed a day in which he will judge the world and righteousness through a man whom he determined, having furnished proof to all by raising him from the dead. So here's Paul standing among the smart guys. And he says, he, the proof that he's the judge that you're going to have to answer to is that God raised him from the dead. What was the response? Verse 32, when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer. Verse 34, but some men joined him and what? Believed. Among whom also are, then he gives us names, and a church is begun in Athens. From Jerusalem into Judea and Samaria, into the Gentile world of wisdom, those who heard the gospel preached knew that they had to believe in a resurrected man. If you want sinners to believe with biblical faith, neglecting the resurrection won't help. Omitting the resurrection will not help. 
Postponing the discussion about the resurrection will not help. We must preach not only Jesus Christ crucified for forgiveness of sins, but we also must preach Jesus Christ raised from the dead. Resurrected Jesus is the object of biblical faith. And this New Testament document that details the very first expansion of the gospel from Jerusalem through Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth, it made Jesus Christ raised from the dead the issue and the focal point of saving faith. Let me just ask you, in your recent witnessing, and the, 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 think back to the most recent time you tried to share the gospel with someone and you were sharing the gospel with them. You, you, the, the last chance you had to testify about Jesus Christ's work in your life. Can you recall if you mentioned the resurrection of Jesus Christ or not? Can you hear yourself in a prior conversation having said that God actually requires sinners to believe in a man who's raised from the dead? He's not dead. Listen, we can be very serious about the great commission, but sadly go about it with the great omission, which is we leave the resurrection out and we can't do that. This document, this New Testament book, and a whole bunch of other ones won't let you do that. The Great Commission expanded beyond imagination in, as the first gospel preachers called sinners everywhere across the Roman Empire to cast themselves in faith on what was an impossibility from the human realm of thought. Yeah, I'll believe that what's impossible from the human realm of thought, I'll believe that he's raised from the dead. That a man suffered and died under the wrath of God. I mean, there's three men up there. One's a thief, the guy in the middle's not, the other guy's a thief. Can I really see a difference of what's going on here? Why did it get so dark outside? Why is the ground shaking? That requires faith to believe that, that the wrath of God is being poured out in an afternoon, not on three guys, but on one guy. That requires faith. It requires faith to say, and they put him in a grave and he's not there. And if you want to be saved... You must believe that. You must believe that. If God has designed biblical faith to be focused on, um, to focus in on his son raised from the dead, but we fail to make a big deal of that, then we're actually impeding biblical faith. Do you understand that? And, we, and, and nobody gets up in the morning and says, you know what I'm going to do today? I'm going to obstruct biblical faith in my children by not talking about the resurrection. Nobody says that, I hope, right? But, but, but it can happen, can it? Because we just forget that that's crucial. Make faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ the focal point of what you're talking to your little ones about. Your classmates co-workers. So Acts has illustrated for us so far that biblical faith is the God-encompassed whole casting of self on resurrected Christ. Let's finish our definition. Faith is the God-encompassed whole casting of self on resurrected Christ for what? Salvation and daily living. These two outcomes for, uh, for faith go together. Biblical faith is not a one and done dimensional thing in your life. That you merely entrust yourself to Jesus Christ for salvation, and then that's it. Biblical faith is a living faith. It is an ongoing faith. Biblical faith is not just essential for your past conversion. Listen, biblical faith is not something that you see in the rearview mirror of your life. Oh, yeah. I remember that. I remember when I believed. 19 years old, February 1985. Yep, I believed then. That's right. Okay, where am I going? That's not biblical faith. Biblical faith is right out in front of you, beyond your windshield. It is for your daily needs. Biblical faith is for your daily living for Christ. Biblical faith is for your sanctification process. Biblical faith is for the trials that God has you in right now. Biblical faith is for everything you need today. Listen, you can't not live by faith today. 
So let's start with the first fruit of biblical faith. Let's, let's talk about salvation. Let's talk about forgiveness of sin. When the God encompassed whole casting of self on resurrected Christ is given by grace to sinners across the Roman Empire. Acts provides for us a key list of salvation terms that are associated with that biblical faith. Let's go to Acts chapter 10. Turn there with me. Acts 10. This is back at Cornelius' house. The gospel going to the Gentiles for the first time. Acts chapter 10, verse 43. Here's what Peter said. Of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. There it is, forgiveness of sins. Go to Acts chapter 13, verse 39, Paul's first missionary journey in um, Antioch. Chapter 13, verse 39, everyone who believes is justified from all things which you could not be justified from through the law. Everyone who believes is justified. Faith is associated with justification. Go to Acts chapter 15, verse 9. Peter again, he made no distinction between us Jews and them Gentiles, cleansing their hearts by what? Faith. Cleansing of the inner man associated with faith. Go to Acts chapter 16, verse 31. Paul's second missionary journey, he's calling out to the Philippian jailer who's about to kill himself, and he says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be what? Saved. Salvation associated with biblical faith. And go to one more. Go to Acts chapter 26. Paul is in jail in Caesarea. He is before Governor Festus and King Agrippa. Acts chapter 26, verse 18. I have appointed you, Jesus said, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the authority of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. There is only one way for you to receive forgiveness of sin. There is only one way for you to be declared righteous with a righteousness that you have never achieved and could never achieve for yourself, but that God accepts. There is only one way for you to be cleansed at the inner man heart level before God. There is only one way for you to be saved and to be set apart for God, to receive the salvation inheritance that he has for you. It is biblical faith. That's conversion. That's salvation. So in your home, listen, in your home, in your school, at your work, in a tribe far away on the other side of the planet, you must make the absence of all of these the issue for them. You must make the absence of these the issue for your children. You have sin and you are not forgiven. You must believe Jesus. You do not have a righteousness that God will accept. You must believe Jesus. Your heart, your inner person before God needs to be cleansed. It's not, it's you are filthy before him. All of your righteous deeds, so-called, are are filthy rags before God. You must believe Jesus to be cleansed at the heart level before him. You are in great danger. You must be saved. You must be rescued, delivered. You must believe Jesus. Jesus. To receive the salvation inheritance he has for you, you need biblical faith. They have to first understand how dreadful and precarious their situation is before any of these things even make sense. Why would a guy undergo open heart surgery if he has no idea that his heart is about to stop? But as soon as he understands how serious it is, he's like, doctor, cut me open. Let's do this. Save me. That biblical faith is not a one and done kind of faith exercised once and then shelved. Watch carefully what Peter said. Go back to Acts chapter 15, verse uh, verse 11. The Jerusalem council, the debate is whether or not you just believe or do you need to believe and be obedient to the law. Watch carefully what Peter says. You can just skip over this so easily. Here's a, I'll, I'll, I'll translate it in the sense of the, the tense of the verb, okay? Here's what Peter says. But we are believing 
that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they also are. He doesn't say, well, we believed that we were saved by grace. He says, even on this day in this Jerusalem council, Peter is saying, we are believing that still. I cling to that today by faith, he says. Peter kept on believing the very same thing. God saves sinners not by merit, but through faith alone. And you need to believe that every single day. What you believed when God first saved you, you must still believe even today. You never graduate from exercising this biblical faith. It never retires. It never started the game, but then gets subbed out later. And Paul expressed the great need to daily press on in faith. Go back to Acts chapter 14, verse 19. Acts 14, verse 19. Paul expressed the great need to daily press on in faith in the New Testament teaching that he brought to each place as an apostle, especially in the face of real risk and threat and trouble. Look at chapter 14, verse 19. The Jews came from Antioch of Pisidia and Iconium, and after winning over the crowds and stoning Paul, they were dragging him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. But while the disciples stood around him, he rose up and entered into the city. The next day, he went away with Barnabas to Derbe. And after that, after they had proclaimed the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned back to the place where he was being stoned and to Antioch. And what were they doing? They were strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying, through many afflictions, we must enter the kingdom of God. That powerful body of truth that ushers us into eternal life, that sustains us daily, that must be believed, is often called the faith in the New Testament. It is the truth that must be believed, and so it gets called what it requires. If it requires you to have faith, they can refer to it as, well, this is the faith that you must, this is what you must believe and entrust yourself to. And that's what Paul is talking about. It is the truth that must be believed, so it is called what it requires. Paul is not calling these new Christians to merely reminisce about the truth that they heard once long ago, but they must continue to believe that day that he's talking to them, the trustworthy truth. Paul says that the pathway that they are on, they just planted a church. They saw Paul be stoned and almost killed. He says, between here and the kingdom of God, this path is full of many afflictions, and we have to go through many of those afflictions to get to the kingdom of God. And Paul calls them, he calls us to continue on in what must be believed each day. Biblical faith, listen, it ushers in salvation realities like forgiveness of sin, a cleansed heart, justification. It ushers those things in and, not but, and it is also for the long and dangerous path leading up to the kingdom on earth. Biblical faith is not merely in your rear view mirror behind you. It has to be exercised today, guys. God has given you not only um, a powerful faith that initially saves you, but he has also given you one that is sturdy enough for daily living on a path full of threats. A guy who pulled himself out from underneath a pile of rocks comes out and says, don't quit believing. You must press on in what must be believed, even today. I know what you just saw, but you must believe today what you believed at the beginning. You must exercise this faith today, not because you've lost your salvation, but because life is full of troubles and life is full of trials that you cannot endure without faith in Jesus Christ. 
And God has for you a robust, durable, versatile, good for every season of life faith for you. He does. From your conversion all the way to his kingdom, God, a God-encompassed faith meets you in every need of your life. And that's what the book of Acts has to contribute in regards to biblical faith. Do you remember Stephen? Do you remember Barnabas? Men who were called full of faith. They were men who were never caught empty, running on empty for the moment they were in. Would you call yourself a woman full of faith? A man full of faith? Faith is the God-encompassed, whole casting of self on Christ for salvation and daily living. Let's pray. Oh, Father, thank you for requiring from us a faith that we could never generate ourselves and for giving that faith that you require of us. You are so kind, and it is so durable. It is so able to uphold us even in bad news, even in big seasons of life changes that are coming through the loss of a family member, through just difficult trials, through dry periods and coldness of heart, this faith is durable for every moment, every situation. It's perfect for us. And we didn't create it. You did, and you gave it, and you ask us to hold on to it and exercise it. Lord, I pray for Grace Bible Church that you will increasingly make us into a family that would cast ourselves entirely holy with abandon, that we would just abandon ourselves to your son, please, and then take us and send us to the ends of the earth, send us through our neighborhoods, our households, our workplaces, our classrooms, help us to keep pushing the gospel to the ends of the earth, and we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.